On in October 2016, Jordan Peterson almost instantly became a global phenomenon, a voice heard by millions, a moral authority to be listened to around the globe, a public intellectual, a source of inspiration to, and hope to countless men and women. The Wall Street Journal states that the startling success of his elevated arguments for the importance of order has made him the most significant conservative thinker to appear in the English-speaking world in a generation. We are proud and honored that Dr. Jordan Peterson accepted the 2022 Oswald Spengler Award and we awarded for his invaluable contribution to applied conservative philosophy grounded in scientific knowledge of the human species and human behavior, the humanities and mythology, and for bridging the gaps between those fields and for speaking out. The Oswald Spengler Prize is selectively awarded to personalities who make truly significant contributions of global relevance in the sciences, the arts, or social and political thought. It has so far been awarded only twice before to French historian, uh, to French writer Michel Ulbeck and to historian Walter Scheidel teaching in Stanford. The prize recipients and its namesake all share an important characteristic. They are aware of the biological, psychological, and sociobiological traits and limitations of our species and acknowledge them as a basis of their work. This creates a realistic, unideological, and I would say conservative approach. Great books, archetypes, dreams, myths, the origin of conflicts and prejudices and their rationalization, evolutionary biology, neuroscience. Jordan Peterson's work is in the very center of the Oswald Spengler Society's interests um, by exploring those fields and bridging the disciplines. It was actually very difficult to get Dr. Peterson. For almost a year, I tried every email address and other address I could find. Then I made a final attempt. I almost gave up, but never give up is, is uh, one of the teachings we get from Jordan Peterson. Then I made a final attempt through my publisher, who had also acquired the German rights to Beyond Order. And when our letter reached Dr. Peterson, he immediately accepted the prize. No further questions, no safeguarding. Quite untypical for our times. This to me is a sign of a man safely established, a man sure of, of his judgment and position, the sign of an eminent man. We did have a meeting and a discussion months later in Tallinn, Estonia. Peterson had just lectured to an audience of 5,000 people the evening before. He was the same person I see in social media, open, curious, explaining, enjoying, exploring, a real and enjoying a real discussion. On a side note, I'm happy to report that Michel Ulbeck and Walter Scheidel both also accepted right away without hesitation and discussion. With the gracious acceptance by Jordan Peterson, the Oswald Spengler Prize has established itself as the most important global award for realistic thought about humanity and humans. That is aside from the Nobel Prize, but that prize has a different focus. The board of directors of the society, a society of individuals and academics solely devoted to the pursuit of truth, the study of humanity and world history, will do its utmost to protect the exceptional standards set by the first three prize recipients. It is well worth watching the video of Peterson's defense of free speech at the University of Toronto that propelled him into the center of the debate of many issues of today. Free speech, gender theory, cancel culture, self-responsibility, civil debate, freedom, and ultimately the question how to defend our values as enlightened and free societies. Peterson had set up a microphone and a small amplifier in front of the university building to talk about Bill C-16, a law adding gender identity or expression as a prohibited ground of discrimination. In other words, a law making gender language mandatory and its non-use a public offense. When some students disturb the speech and eventually disconnect the amplifier, Peterson continues with a strong voice against a loud backdrop of protesters and supporters, supporters too, to make his points. I quote, Putting restrictions on free speech is something dangerous beyond comprehension. And that's what we're faced with. We have to be able to say what we are willing to say badly, or we won't be able to think at all. And I know where that leads. I've studied totalitarianism for four decades, and I know how it starts. 
strong words spoken with authority and deep conviction. But even if Jordan Peterson became an intellectual superstar overnight, his prominence is hard earned, rests on solid ground, and took a life of preparation, thinking, and learning. Up to the time of his fame, he had authored or co-authored more than 100 academic papers and had, by all measure, a truly exceptional and stellar academic record. His books, his first book and his later books, show the development of a mind, give insights into his thinking, and they allow us to share in his further intellectual journey, or rather his series of heroes' journeys, out of each of which the hero emerges, shaken, having lost something, but transformed, refined, stronger. The last of these journeys was a serious and long-lasting illness that nearly led to our hero's death. We are relieved beyond expression that Dr. Peterson emerged from it a stronger man. Composing these remarks confronted me with unexpected difficulties, not for lack of material, but to the country because there's so many aspects to write. So in the rest of my speech, I will focus on three themes. First, some ideas, themes and areas of interest shared by Jordan Peters and Oswald Spengler. Second, very briefly, the meaning of conservative. And third, the problems and challenges of today, Spengler's predictions and Peterson's antidote. If some of what I may say does not make sense the first time you hear it, I can only encourage you to study and read Peterson and Spengler. If you've read Peterson and find some of the Spengler quotes resonant, go ahead and read Spengler. It can't hurt. And if you're Spenglerian and tended to view Peterson as a contemporary and temporary phenomenon, read Peterson. You will be surprised. On a side note, Oswald Spengler in his time too was a, regarded as a contemporary phenomenon. Quite a few colleagues begrudged him his fame. Still, his thoughts continue to influence and inform us today. If I may venture a prediction, so will Dr. Peterson's, because they go deep, because they provide meaning, because they are what contemporary philosophy should be, interdisciplinary, deeply grounded, practical, and immensely relevant. So what are some of the common themes in Peterson's and Spengler's work? Here's Jordan Peterson, the academic and clinical psychologist with a stellar academic record that turned public intellectual. There are Oswald Spengler, the private scholar with an MIA in biology and a doctorate in philosophy. Both became famous in their time, seemingly overnight, but in reality after a long time of thinking, research, and reflection. As a psychologist, Peterson wants to understand and help people. What motivates us? How do our brains and emotions work? What makes us tick? This led him to branch out in very different directions, neuroscience, behavioral psychology, mythology, and religion. Oswald Spengler, too, uses the word soul a lot. He wants to understand cultures, seeing them as individuals of higher order, each having its own life cycle, just as individuals have. From his understanding, Spengler also derives practical advice for our, or better, his times, as we've heard from David Engels. The Decline of the West is a work bristling with interdisciplinary and cross-cultural references, taking ancient wisdom seriously on its own terms. Indeed, Spengler was the first to overcome Eurocentrism in history and anthropology. Alas, today, he's labeled a rightist. Peterson and Spengler are both highly compassionate and sensitive thinkers, a few years ago, the diary entries of the young Spengler were published, giving insights into a tormented, sensitive soul. Peterson, in turn, faced his own demons. One also thinks of Friedrich Nietzsche. But maybe in addition to a brilliant mind, such sensitivity is needed to truly observe people in society, to put oneself into the mindset of another culture, or into the mindset of a concentration camp guard, as Peterson wants us wants us to do to think what made this possible. As, as Jordan Peterson relates, the understanding of the horrible events of the 20th century, two world wars, Hitler, Stalin, the Gulags, the Khmer Rouge, Rwanda and Burundi, was a major motivating force for his early work. Gerd Morgenthaler mentioned that Peterson distinguishes the world as a place of things and a forum for action. Bengler makes the very same distinction, but uses a different terminology. Nature, for Spengler, is a place of things. History, be it in its modern or in its earlier forms of mythology and religion, 
is the form of meaning. Indeed, this dichotomy is central to understanding decline of the West, and many pairs of opposite terms refer to it, number and face, nature and history, taboo and totem, priesthood and nobility, truth, wahrheit, and facts, tatsachen. There are even references to something like the great father and the great mother in Spengler. What is missing is the great son. I'll give you three quotes and, uh, uh, um, and I'll then say who they were from. Quote one, I've been attempting to consider history itself as a unitary phenomenon, as a single thing in one sense, in order to understand what it is and how it affects what I think and what I do. If you realize that history is in some sense in your head, and you also realize that you know nothing of the significance of history, of its meaning, which is certainly true, then you must realize that you know nothing of yourself and of your own meaning. I'm writing this, my book, in an attempt to explain the psychological significance of history, to explain the meaning of history. Quote two, is there a logic of history? Is there beyond all the casual and incalculable elements of the separate events, something that we may call a metaphysical structure of historic humanity, something that is essentially independent of the outward forms, social, spiritual, and political, which we see so clearly. Does world history present to the seeing eye certain grand traits again and again with sufficient constancy to justify certain conclusions? And if so, what are the limits to which such reasoning might be pushed? In short, is all history founded upon general um, biographic archetypes? Quote three, all cultures, even those most disparate in nature, develop along broadly predictable lines and have within their mythological history certain constant features. End of quote three. I could quote many others. The initiated few will be able to assign them to their proper sources, but to most ears, they will sound remarkably similar. Quote one, Jordan Peterson. Two, Oswald Spengler. Three, Peterson again. I could quote many more. To Peterson, the way in which we label, judge, and categorize our events, our worldview, or Weltanschauung, the automatic attribution of meaning to things is predetermined by our culture and has always been passed down from one person to another by means of art, music, and religion and tradition and not by rational explanation. It is like translating from one language to another. That, of course, is one of Spengler's central tenets, that each culture has its own style that expresses itself in architecture, government, art, organization, and virtually all aspects of its life. If history provides meaning, as would religion and mythology, then it is there to form identity to give order to social events, to create an us versus a them. Throughout most of history, this has meant degrading the other, the unknown. It is by, not by coincidence that many early societies and tribes only call their own tribe humans and all others something else, that the Greeks and Romans labeled all others barbarians. This pernicious tendency leads to, in Peterson's words, the paradox at the bottom of human motivation for evil. People need their group identification, but the tendency to protect one's own can lead to hatred of the other and to war. So history is not the history of class conflicts, as Marx would have it, but the history of conflicts, period. Friedrich Nietzsche, who had a significant influence on both Jordan Peterson and Oswald Spengler, provided deep, if not only very systematic, insight into the relativity and functionality of morals. In doing so, one could argue that Nietzsche pioneered sociobiology by now a respected, if somewhat hidden, discipline. Contemporary pioneers of that discipline, like biologist Edward O. Wilson and sociologist Napoleon Chagnon, in the late 1970s were defamed, vilified, and nearly destroyed as biological reductionists by their leftist colleagues as early as the 1970s and 1980s. But piece by piece, empirical research has uncovered that we are being run and dominated by bi biological and behavioral programs to a much greater extent than even we thought possible just a few decades, decades ago. One can make the point, and I think our laureate would, that only the knowledge of the programs running inside us enables us as humans to leave our predicaments behind and 
behind us and evolve in our thinking and behavior. Jordan Peterson knows that real thinking is hard and it's rare, that we have to look behind the facade of things to make sense of them. And Jordan Peterson has used that insight to push both our knowledge and to stand up for what we, men and women of the West, believe to be our values, our heritage, and the values that brought us to where we are today. So what makes a conservative? Jordan Peterson has been labeled a conservative thinker. He himself terms himself a classical liberal. I will name four and briefly discuss two of those aspects. First, respect for traditions and institutions. This is what most people would have in mind first. Jordan Peterson picks up that theme in rule number one in his recent book, Beyond Order. Second, knowledge of the weakness and volatility of most humans or their capacity for good and evil and the frailty of civilization. Most of us are pretty easily swayed to do terrible things given the right environment. So when thinking about Nazi, for, Nazi Germany, for example, instead of Oscar, uh, identifying with Oskar Schindler, Peterson urges you to put yourself into the shoes of a concentration camp guard. Third, an awareness that we as humans will inevitably face moral dilemmas in the course of our life. We can either ignore them, which is the road to hell or totalitarianism or face them. Edmund Burke, the first conservative thinker on this, the choices of men are often between differences of good in compromises, sometimes between good and evil, and sometimes between evil and evil. This knowledge lets conservatives accept limits, limits set by their life situation, their obligations, by tradition, by institutions. The sky is rarely the limit. Conservatives prefer to work at one problem at a time, starting with themselves, and they know that improvement is hard. I'm working on one problem right now, which Dr. Peterson inspired me to work on. I'm working on a full winter knot. I'm still working on it, so but <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to improve incrementally there. Fourth, before, before, because conservatives know what humans can do, they are deeply distrustful of ideologies and grand schemes to improve society. They know that such schemes can quickly turn into the roads to hell. Jordan Peterson has brilliantly lined out the psychology of ideologies. Ideologies want to improve society or others on a grand scale. They do not tolerate differing viewpoints. In their extreme form, they want to exterminate ideas or even people that do not conform to their ideology. Driving forces are bad and even evil sentiments, resentment and disgust. I learned a lot from Jordan Peterson's lecture on disgust. If you hate somebody, you at least acknowledge his or her existence as an enemy. If you are disgusted by something, you do not want to think about it at all and just want to do away with it. Conservatives know that we better start with ourselves if we want to improve something. The left today is constructivist. Everything to them is a social contract. Your sex, for example. If you want to change it, just change the entry in your ID card or have actual operations. In some countries, adolescents now have the right to do such operations, even against the will of their parents. And it's being pushed in Germany too. Race is a construct. So are nation states. It's ironic that in a sense, conservatives are constructivists themselves. They know that human behavior can cover a wide range, that the human mind can be made to believe many things, that societies behave in many ways, and some of the outcomes can be horrible. But conservatives are realists. They know that quite a few things are not constructs, but observable facts of life. Peterson mentions Price's law as such a fact of life. There are numerous others. The difference in play of girls and boys, um, the life rhythms and motivations of men and women, on average, that significantly accept their career and life choices. The famous lobster example at the beginning of 12 Rules for Life is a brilliant exposition of the pervasiveness and persistence of hierarchies in animal, but equally in human life. Dominance hierarchies, about which Peterson speaks a lot, are present everywhere. And if we don't see them, it is because we, haven't, we have willingly closed our eyes. 
Spengler often mentions the naked facts of life that can't be ignored, either by politicians or philosophers. One of those facts is that the more developed states, even that is a word that we shouldn't say today, but I do, the more developed states and societies become, the more differentiated their hierarchies and social orders are. Spengler in 1919, among all the people of Western Europe, these two, the English and the Prussian German, are uh, one are dis is distinguished by a rigid social hierarchy. It puts every individual in the pre precise location in which he is needed most. Centuries are required for the clarification and realization of this special feeling for social structure. The English people is structured along a lines of wealth and poverty, the Prussian along lines of command and obedience. It is important to note that liberalism gone overboard is an ideolo ide ideology itself. Jordan Peterson describes himself as a classical liberal. Classical liberals, as well as conservatives, are well aware that a market economy, the market itself, needs moral foundations. The market is not the moral, it needs for moral foundations. Adam Smith wrote extensively about this in his theory of moral sentiments. This is why libertarianism, in my opinion, contains all the dangers of a potential ideology. The market is not an absolute moral principle. There are markets and hierarchies, and both have their le legitimate functions in social and economic life. Let me come to my last section. Spengler's predictions and Peterson's antidotes. When we look at the state of the West, it be can only be described as dismal. David Engels mentioned some of the points. Free speech is being censored, and not so gently for that anymore. Freedom itself is at stake. Free movement has been severely restricted to the, during the COVID episode. The surveillance state is on the rise. Education is on the decline. A totalitarian ideology focuses on re-engineering climate and ultimately re-engineering humanity is on the rise. When we met, Dr. Peterson asked me how Spengler's predictions were holding up. Uh, I quote on this Joseph Campbell, a lifelong Oswald Spengler fan and a mythologist, who said as early as 1970, well, I can tell you it has been something of a life experience to have watched the not so gradual coming to fulfillment in this world of every bit of what Spengler promised. One of those dire predictions is that the age of democracy in all cultures lasting for about 200 years will end sometimes between 2000 and 2050 in a development analogous to the end of the Roman Republic. Along with this will come the end of universal conscription and the rise of professional armies around the year 2000. I quote Spengler, in the period of contending states, torrents of blood have reddened the pavements of all world cities so that the great truths of democracy might be turned into actualities and for the winning of rights without which life seemed not to be worth living. Now these rights are won, but the grandchildren cannot be moved even by punishment to make use of them. A hundred years more, and even the historians will no longer understand the old controversies. Another prediction. The final empire of the West will be dominated by a single center, a totalitarian structure organized along a single principle, in one sense, Peterson's tyrannical father. For Spengler, the question was whether this principle would be English, the total freedom of the individual, of unrestricted private property, a civil society without a state, or Prussian, a dominant state regulating all aspects of life. It is the fight between, thus Spengler, two systems of social, social stratification, one that is based on wealth and the uninhibited struggle for success, and one that is founded on authority and legislation. There can be no reconciliation. Neither of these principles can accept restriction of its will, and neither can be satisfied until the whole world has succumbed to its particular idea. This was written in 1919. Spengler asks further whether those who command the coming empire will be billionaires or universal administrators. As for the billionaire, Spengler again, the billionaire demands absolute freedom to arrange world affairs by 
by his private decisions with no other ethical standard than success. He beats down armies with credit and speculation as his weapons. His state and his army are his trust, and the political state is little more than an agent who commissions with wars and with treaties and negotiations. Those words written in 1919 have an eerie ring today. When all questions have been debated, Spengler sees our culture sink into a second religiousness. The rise of Islam and radical sects is one sign of this, and the climate and gender cults have taken on religious forms to and shape the belief systems of much of the younger generation. It could well be that the last religion of the West will be transhumanism, which is on the surface an anti-religious movement. When we dig deeper, however, we can see many aspects that constitute a perverted religious belief system. I would have loved to see Jordan Peterson and Oswald Spengler discuss religion and the state of religion. Both have thought deeply about it in relation to what it means to humans and our culture. Both would have had much common ground and hopefully quite a few fruitful disagreements. Spengler predicted more. He pointed to moral decadence, was the first to see envir environmental degradation as a large-scale problem in men and techniques, and in the, in the 1920s considered the rise of a second caliphate in the Orient, when suddenly no one questions the authority of the caliph anymore. It is worth remembering that at the time the Islamic world was a beaten down backwater, hardly worth mentioning. There are, according to Oswald Spengler, dark times ahead. So my very final words and section, what are Jordan Peterson's antidotes for the time to, times to come? I will only point towards three of his many helpful medicines and add one suggestion of my own. One is confront the unknown and stay adaptive. Explaining rule number nine, assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't. Peterson states that what we don't know is much more important than what we do know. Humans have a tendency to stay with the known. It is much more convenient, but it is dangerous to not face the unknown. We simply don't know what's coming. And even if Spengler gives us some ideas, this still does not provide us with a course of action. So let us remain alert and let us try to be adaptive. Two, pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. I will refrain from rephrasing the chapter dealing with this, rule number seven. It is brilliant, full of wisdom and surprising insight, as are the other chapters of the book. If, if you haven't done so yet, do read 12 Rules for Life. The pursuit of meaning essentially makes us human. Therefore, to Peterson, the pursuit of happiness is a pointless goal. Or in Oswald Spengler's words, no one living in any part of the world today will be happy, but many will be able to control by the exercise of their own will the greatness or insignificance of their life course. In the pursuit of meaning, we have to give up something to make sacrifices. I've watched Jordan Peterson take an increasingly open stance on political issues in addition to gender theory and wokeism, the COVID pandemic, even the Ukraine war. Dr. Peterson, you are risking a lot for the sake of all of us. Who knows what further actions those in power will conceive in their inevitable attempts to put you down? No. Dr. Peterson, you haven't changed. You've applied your thinking to more of the problems of today. We profoundly thank you for that. We also thank your wife for rendering her support to your mission. Third, cherish and maintain traditions. Conservatives know that institutions are there for reason, that they are the result of a complex process in which societies grapple for solutions. Do not carelessly denigrate social institutions or creative achievement is rule number one in beyond order. I would go a step further. Cherish, foster, and participate in traditions. Many institutions of civil society have disappeared. Others have nearly been destroyed by the internet or the COVID pandemic. Seek out institutions you can identify with and participate. One, one tradition that comes at a low economic price is great literature. Jordan Peterson is well versed in the classics. Most colleagues, colleges have taken the classics class off the curriculum. 
but nothing prevents you from reading those books. There's great comfort in reading Marcus Aurelius and realizing that two millennia ago, this man grappled with many of the questions we are faced with today, even coming up with some pretty good answers. I'm watching with horror how books are being edited, some even withdrawn. Establish a physical library before it is too late. It may help you to get through some rough times. Three, look for unexpected beauty when you encounter it and be grateful in spite of, in spite of your suffering. Twelve rules for life and beyond order close with a similar theme. There's beauty to be found even in bad times, and there are things to be grateful for even in misery. Look out and create your own beauty. Peterson encourages us to pet a cat on the street when we encounter one. And uh, he adds, if you want to rather pet a dog, that's okay too. You can also, of course, build your own furniture, as Dr. Peterson does, or grow your own vegetables, as I do, or have your, have your, um, do whatever uh, helps you in the pursuit of beauty and create that oasis of, of, of thought and beauty. Let me add one more suggestion. And this is not from Jordan Peterson, but from Friedrich August von Hayek, whom I don't agree with on quite a few things. Because, uh, well, whatever. In The Road to Serfdom, Friedrich August von Hayek in 1944 describes with great lucidity how societies slide into totalitarianism. One thing that totalitarian states and societies don't like at all is being is activities being conducted for their own sake. In communist states, a communist physics or music or ethics for that purpose is being called for. The same is true for national socialism, or I'm afraid for the new ideologies of our times, wokeism and transhumanism. They all want to serve science, art and every aspect of life their own purpose. This is wrong. So let us do things for their own sake. Pursue truth and seek beauty, appreciate great works of art. Do things for their own sake, in the, is a, doing things for their own sake is a sign of a truly independent person. It is also a powerful antidote to totalitarianism, though not without risk. What makes Dr. Peterson's antidote so powerful is that they connect us with the eternal questions of humanity to create a potent mixture that can indeed strengthen us for the things to come. And there are things to come. I think those in the room here know this, and quite a few of us know this. We see the forces of division at work when we look around. Indeed, in nothing is the power of the Dark Lord more clearly shown than in the estrangement that divides all those who still oppose him, says the elf Haldir in The Lord of the Rings. Jordan Peterson provides a voice and an example for all those who still oppose the dark forces. He has become a crystallizing force for those who see and want to stop the madness. As long as the times still allow for Jordan Peterson to emerge and to persist, not all is lost. In an article in the Harvard Business Re Review in 1977, Abraham Zelesnik asked the question, uh, what makes managers and what makes leaders. His conclusions, managers manage, leaders search for and provide meaning. Jordan Peterson goes a step beyond that. He helps others to search for meaning and in doing so, he's more than a leader. He's a leader's coach and a leader's leader. Dr. Peterson, you have enriched our lives in difficult times. You're a shining light because you know what darkness is. You stand in the best tradition of the enlightened West. You've been a soul courageous voice in an ocean of unreason. You have given hope to innumerable people. We applaud you. We stand behind you and we vest our hopes in you. May the Lord give you and your family strength and protect you. As a tribute to your invaluable contributions and as a sign of our appreciation and respect, we present you with the 2022 Oswald Spengler Award.